My name is Russ Miller, and I live in Flagstaff, Arizona. My wife Joanna and I have a ministry that we call Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministries. We came up with this name because sometimes we talk about creation and biblical accounts, and other times, like we're going to do this evening, we talk about evolution and evolutionary accounts. So, <clears throat> it's important to realize that these are both religious beliefs. Now think about this logically. We're taught in school today, and our kids are taught that Darwinian evolution is science, and that biblical creation is a religious belief. But aren't they both philosophies on how we came about? Aren't they both about our origins? Aren't they both exactly the same thing? Exactly the same thing. I am not the one saying that one is science and one is religious. They are both religious beliefs. But you can take the science, and those are things you can test, study, and observe, and compare to the accounts of evolution found in the textbooks or to the accounts found in the Bible about creation and the global flood. And you can take that evidence and you will see that one of the accounts matches up very well with the evidence, whereas the other one hardly ever matches the evidence. Yet the one that doesn't match <laughs> is taught as science today. So we're going to talk about the religious belief of Darwinian evolution tonight. In the 1971 foreword to Darwin's uh, book, The Reprint, it states that belief in evolution is exactly parallel to belief in special creation. You have to have faith in either one because there, we're talking about events of the past that aren't there to test, study, and observe today. You can take evidences that, that you can observe today and try to extrapolate them backwards, but you can't actually test the past. It's no wonder the Bible warns us, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the rudiments of the world, after the traditions of man, and not after Christ. The Bible warns us, beware of man's philosophies. And there really are only two viable options. Either God created the world, just like he says he did, or the world evolved on its own. Those are your two viable options. I don't know what it's like in Salt Lake City. In Flagstaff, we do have a group that says, well, maybe we're not here at all. Maybe we just think we're here. But as a general rule, I don't worry about that group because we are really here. Here is a college textbook telling the kids, we focus on the scientific study of the origin of the human species, evolution. They claim an enormous quantity of evidence supports evolution. Well, if Darwinian evolution is true, then there should be undeniable evidences. They should have literally hundreds of millions of undeniable pieces of evidence showing that evolution took place from a Darwinian macro scale. And the Bible tells us to prove all things and to hold fast to that which is good. So let's take a look at some science versus the teachings in the humanistic-owned textbooks about Darwinian evolution. Let's look at the first law of thermodynamics, the law of conservation of mass and energy, which basically states that matter and or energy cannot be created or destroyed. So I have to ask the evolutionists, where did the energy come from to power my laptop or the lights in this building or to spin the planet or to power the sun or the stars throughout the universe? Where did the energy come from? Well, let's go back to a college science book for a, a scientific explanation. It says, well, in the beginning, all the energy was condensed into an inconceivably tiny speck. The laws of physics can't account for this. Okay, this goes against various laws of physics. They can't account for this, but this is their best explanation. In other words, they can't logically account for the energy. So let's move on to the next question. Where did all the matter come from to make this podium, this building, the planet that we live on, the entire universe? Where did the matter come from? Oh, well, let's go back to the college book once again. Kids, the tiny speck of energy began to expand, and by three minutes, atomic nuclei appeared. Well, think about this logically. They can't tell you if the Big Bang took place 6 billion years ago or 13 billion years ago or 20 billion years ago. It's constantly changing. Yet they're going to tell us what happened at the three-minute mark. 
That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. This is a religious belief. It's not based on testable, observable science. In fact, a letter signed by dozens of scientists appeared in New Scientist called Bucking the Big Bang. It included these statements. The Big Bang Theory can boast no predictions that have been validated by observation. Claim successes consist of retrospectively making observations fit by adding adjustable parameters. For instance, let's look at some of their adjustable parameters in our own solar system. Cosmic collisions are one of the magic wands that, that prop up the failed predictions of materialistic naturalism. Uranus is tilted over. Venus rotates the wrong way. The atmosphere of Mars is too thin. The planet Mercury is too dense to fit their predictions. Therefore, they make up a cosmic collision. Something must have collided with these different orbs in order to change the predicted outcome. The letter went on to state, the Big Bang relies on a growing number of never observed entities, such as inflation, dark energy, dark matter, and can't survive without these fudge factors. In no other field of physics would this continual recourse to new hypothetical factors be accepted. It's only accepted because it's supporting a religious belief, not a scientific endeavor. One of the proofs thrown out as proof of the Big Bang is red-shifted starlight. They say that stellar motion assumes that the stars are speeding away from the supposed Big Bang, which causes the red shift. But actually, there are other explanations for red-shifted starlight. The second-order Doppler effect says that a light source moving at right angles to the observer will always appear red-shifted. Gravity will cause red-shift. When the light passes by a solar system or by a planet uh, or by another star, the gravity can change and cause red shifting in the light. There's photon interaction and even the slowing of light as if, spiral, if galaxies are spiraling towards our planet will cause red shift. So red shifted starlight is not proof of the Big Bang. They also like to claim that microwave background radiation or MBR is leftover energy from the supposed Big Bang. They leave out a lot of uh, problems with this. For instance, without hypothetical inflation, the Big Bang doesn't predict the smooth MBR that is found. Also, there's only a small percentage of the MBR found that was predicted. Now, if the Big Bang is the cause of this MBR, it should all be moving out away from the Big Bang. But actually, the MBR is going in different directions. Think about this. All stars give off microwave background radiation. I suspect the stars are the source of the MBR. Also, if the Big Bang took place billions of years ago, by now, all of the matter in space should be evenly distributed, but it's not. Stars are found in tightly wound up spiral galaxies or balls of stars. In fact, evolutionists refer to this as the winding up dilemma. The universe is too tightly wound up to be old. Well, let's get into the textbooks. Let's go on beyond the Big Bang. They say that this nothingness blew up and 4.6 billion years ago, a big ball of rock formed. And oceans formed as it rained on the rock for millions of years of time. Now you should realize, I used to be a theistic evolutionist. That's a person that tries to blend evolution into the Bible. So I'm not here to attack anyone that believes in evolution or millions of years. I'm here to help them if they're truly seeking the truth of God's word. But I like to kid folks and say, just to get them to realize how silly this is, and I'll say, you guys think we evolved from a rock. And they'll say, no, we don't. I'll say, sure, nothing blew up. The Big Bang, a big rock formed, and it rained on the rock for millions of years, and poof, here we are. Isn't that Darwinism in a nutshell? Well, that's exactly Darwinism in a nutshell. Well, what about the law of biogenesis, a principle of real biology, which is that life only comes from already living matter? So how do they get life started, since we started out with nothing but sterile non-life? Well, they teach that, well, kids, the first living organism was nothing complex. It was a simple little single-cell creature like a bacteria cell. Well, and from there, of course, it 
evolved into everything on earth. In fact, if you look at this textbook, it tells the kids, kids, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended, stated as a fact, from a common ancestor found in a primitive population of unicellular organisms. Well, how is a kid supposed to argue with that? And they've just taught as a fact that everything evolved from that first simple cell creature. And what proof do they have of that? Well, they tell you that two sentences later. No traces of those events remain. There's not a shred of evidence that any of this took place. They're teaching it, and it is a religious belief, not science. In fact, it's undermining real science. The fact is, from a scientific standpoint, that living things require all left-handed amino acids with all right-handed nucleotide sugars. Well, in a natural setting, you're going to end up with a mix of 50% right-handed and 50% left-handed amino acids, so they won't work for life. The probability that these would all come together naturally, all right-handed, excuse me, all left-handed amino acids with right-handed nucleotide sugars is mathematically impossible. Now, proteins are the primary components of cells, and they're usually made up of 20 different, very specific, all left-handed amino acids that have all right-handed nucleotide sugars. Like letters in a sentence, they have to be in a specific order and facing the right direction to have any meaning at all. The letters that make up, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, convey meaning. However, if you mix up the same letters, they convey, they convey no meaning whatsoever. The odds of coming up with this line using randomly dropped Scrabble letters is 1 in 2,810 trillion octillion. In other words, it is mathematically completely impossible. And the same goes for amino acids forming proteins all on their own. They must be in a specific order to have meaning, otherwise they're worthless and actually help destroy the cell. And even the smallest known protein is actually made up of hundreds of these left-handed amino acids with right-handed nucleotide sugars. In fact, one mathematician estimated the odds of just one protein forming on its own in nature to be, and this is if we started with all the 20 left-handed amino acids and were given 15 billion years for it to take place, the odds would be 10 to the 60th power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, 10 to the 50th power is considered absolute zero. That number would account for every molecule in the entire universe. And that's the odds of just one protein forming on its own. The supposed simplest cell requires 600 specific proteins. In other words, there is no mathematical possibility these formed on their own. Since they say we started out as a supposed simple bacteria cell, let's take a quick look at a bacteria cell. The science of biochemistry has found that bacteria cells are actually run by tiny molecular motors called bacterial flagellum. These tiny molecular motors allow the cell to swim around and perform its various functions. It can even change gears depending on how much weight it's towing or pushing. Now these are made up of about 40 very specific and very complex proteins, and they're known as irreducibly complex. That means if any one part of any of the proteins is missing, the entire system would fail. You have to have all the proteins complete and in the right order at the very start of life to form the flagellum, or life could not have started on its own. To make matters worse for naturalistic Darwinism, the process of putting the flagellum together in the right order requires other molecular motors that are themselves irreducibly complex. In other words, the more real science gets into the cell, the more completely impossible Darwinism becomes. Now, humanists are going to claim that parts of the flagellum are found in the bubonic plague bacterium, and that these parts were co-opted to form the flagellum. So they're going to say that these parts formed on their own and came together for the flagellum later on. However, only 10 of the 40 parts of the flagellum have been found elsewhere. The other 30 are brand new. And scientific research has proven that the plague's bacteria apparatus came from 
the de degeneration of the flagellum. So don't let somebody mislead you and tell you that the uh, flagellum co-opted its parts for the parts already existed. They did not. Occasionally, you'll find an evolutionist that will try to tell you that a virus is the missing link between non-life and the first cell. But a living cell is an extremely complex chemical factory that's capable of many various functions, including reproducing itself. A virus has no ability to reproduce itself. It could not have been there first. The living cell had to have been there first, and the virus needs the cell's complex reproduction equipment to procure its own reproduction. By a chemical reaction, a virus can latch on to a living cell and release its limited genetic information into the cell. That information then takes over the cell's apparatus and then reproduces the virus. In fact, the cell eventually bursts, destroying the cell, but releasing the virus to go find more cells to attach to. So the virus is in no way a missing link. Your kids in school today are going to be taught that scientists have been able to come close to creating life in the lab. But when you look at these experiments, if you look closely enough, you'll find that they have come nowhere near overcoming the law of biogenesis and creating life from non-life in the labs. They've been able to come up with some non-living chemical compounds that are found in living matter. It would be like you and I creating calcium. And since calcium is found in people, announcing to the world that we've created a human being. Well, they've come nowhere near creating life in the labs. The law of biogenesis has never been known to have been overcome. Secular humanists try to convince us that if the various parts of a living organism could be intelligently engineered by human scientists in labs, that that would somehow prove that life could have started all on its own. But if they ever even got to the point of creating life in the labs, and they're nowhere close to that at this time, all this would prove is that it takes massive amounts of intelligent design to be able to create life from non-life. The DNA chromosome is the most, uh, excuse me, the, um, the DNA chromosome is the most complex molecule in the universe. One mathematician and molecular biologist calculated the odds of one DNA arranging itself in a natural setting to be one in 10 to the 100 billionth power. Well, what kind of a number is that? Well, I don't know how it is in Utah, but in Arizona, we have a state lottery, and I'm not suggesting that you should play it, but if you did play it, your odds of winning the Arizona lottery every weekend 52 weekends a year for the next 27,000 years in a row would be mathematically better than one DNA chromosome forming on its own in nature. In other words, it could not have taken place. So why do they teach this? Well, this former Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner explains it pretty well. He says, I do not want to believe in God. Now, that's his choice. I feel bad for him, but it is his choice. He says, therefore, I chose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. Any knowledgeable scientist that deals in these fields realizes that Darwinism does not stand a chance of having taken place. It's impossible from many standpoints. They teach it because they don't want to believe in God. That's their choice. But I think Christians need to stand up and stop this false teaching because we are losing about 81% of our children today. By the time they turn 20, four out of five Christian kids are leaving the faith. Well, I should say they're leaving the church. And the reason for this is they're being taught they evolved over millions of years of time, and we need to stand up and start teaching the truth. In fact, this textbook has trouble trying to get over the fact they believe in spontaneous generation, non-life spontaneously generating to living systems. They know it's impossible, but they have to somehow get around this issue. So look what the textbook says. Kids, we do not believe that life arises spontaneously from non-life, but, well, <clears throat> since it was the first living thing, it had to come from non-living chemicals. They don't even know how to explain it. It is such a ridiculous thought. They know it's scientifically impossible, but they're going to do a little uh, dance with some words and just try to move on and hope nobody catches them on this. 
So do living cells form on their own, this textbook, at, this textbook asks. And then it says 3.8 billion years ago, molecules came to be enclosed by membranes and control was exerted. They're, they're talking about how a cell functions. And they're going to make kids think that billions of years ago, it just happened. Let me ask you a question. Who saw a cell form all on its own 3.8 billion years ago? Nobody. That's a religious belief. I don't even think it's a belief. I doubt they even believe that. But any time you hear anything that starts out millions or billions of years ago, you know what you're really hearing? Once upon a time. Because a fairy tale is about to follow. Think about it logically. The world's brightest scientific minds, building on years and years of other people's research with billions of dollars of lab equipment and computers and salaries thrown in, cannot make non-living matter produce living matter. But we're being taught that rocks and seawater did it on their own. Oh, but not today when you could test, study, and observe it. Oh no, long ago and far away. And that's a religious fairy tale masquerading and undermining real science. We as Christians need to stand up and start standing up not only for our faith, but let's return science to the search for truth which is what science is supposed to be. The study of our origins has never been about the evidence. We all have the same evidence. A lot of folks think, well, the evolutionists have their evidence and the biblical creationists have their evidence. No, we all have the exact same evidence. The study of our origins is about the philosophical framework through which the evidences are interpreted. If you have a biblical worldview, you look at things such as the, the finches that Darwin discovered bringing forth finches after their kind, and you realize that's exactly what the Bible says will happen. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. If you believe in Darwinism, you're going to think that proves evolution. But I think what you'll find is that science will stand up perfectly for what the Bible says. In fact, this uh, physics professor had stated, evolution became a scientific religion. And almost all scientists have accepted it, and many are prepared to bend their observations to fit with it. Well, bending observations means lying, and lying undermines real scientific study. You see, the problem we have today is that scientists are forced to toe the evolutionary line. If they do not do so, if they come out and say they don't believe in Darwinism, or they believe, especially if they say they believe in biblical creation, they won't get hired. They won't be promoted. They won't get money to do research. They won't have their papers published. In other words, their career will be through. So it's not based on science. It's based on religious bias. And under the guise that science always corrects itself, humanists continue using unfounded claims to promote their religious philosophy. The word evolution has many meanings, but only one is scientific in nature that you can test, study, and observe it. There's cosmic evolution, like the Big Bang, the origin of space, matter, and time. There's organic evolution, the start of life. And there's macro or Darwinian evolution, which is the origin of new kinds. And this requires major additions of new and beneficial genetic information to the existing gene pools to change one kind into another kind. Now, these first three definitions are all religious in nature. You can't scientifically show any of these having taken place. But the fourth definition, microevolution, is a scientific fact. In fact, you could show millions of examples of microevolution. So if someone were to say to me, Russ, do you believe in evolution? I would say, well, certainly micro. It's important that we understand the difference in these definitions. Micro are simply kinds bringing forth after their kind. They're just changes within that same kind. It's best to take the word evolution out of there because it confuses the issue and call these micro adaptations, changes within the same kind. So let's take a close look at the difference between micro and macro evolution. Once again, let's call micro simply micro adaptations. They're kinds within this, changes within the same kind. We could go down to the pound and get a pair of dogs. Mutts would work the best because they have the widest gene pool. And we could breed those dogs together for a thousand years. And we could take traits among the puppies and breed those puppies together. And we could end up with hundreds of different types of dogs after a thousand years. 
But after a thousand years, how many non-dogs would we have? Now, you laugh about that. Why? Well, because that's a silly thought. Dogs won't produce non-dogs. They're not going to produce parrots or pine trees or pumpkins or anything else, right? <laughs> Absolutely. See, that would be a, an example of Darwinian macroevolution. And today, as of today, no one's ever found a viable example of Darwinian macroevolution to show anybody. Oh, there are a lot of frauds in the textbooks. We're going to start getting into those here in a couple of minutes. But Darwinism is scientifically impossible. You could breed roses. You could get red, white, yellow, pink roses. Some do better in the desert. Some do better up in the mountains where it's cold. But roses will only produce roses. Roses bringing forth roses or dogs bringing forth dogs, even though there can be a wide variation within the kind, they will only bring forth their own kind. These are simply micro-adaptations. So kinds bringing forth after their kind is a scientific fact. And if we wanted to, you could show a million examples of kinds bringing forth after their kind. So why is it important for Christians to understand that micro-adaptations, kinds bringing forth after their kind, is a scientific fact where you could show millions of examples? Do you know why that's important to understand? Because 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told that plants and or animals will bring forth after their kind. And after millions of observations, guess what always takes place? Kinds will bring forth after their kind. And yet the humanistic dominated textbooks are telling you you're crazy if you believe the Bible, and they're teaching that Darwinism is science. And that's 180 degrees opposite of the truth. So once again, I could show millions of examples of kinds bringing forth after their kind, just like the Bible says. Let me give you three facts to remember, and if you will understand and remember these three facts, I will show you how you can destroy Darwinism in seven seconds flat, and you could debate any professor or scientist anywhere in the world from Oxford to Stanford to your local community college and win hands down. Fact number one with regard to micro-adaptations. They always produce the same kind of plant or animal. Farmers can breed cattle and get all sorts of cattle, some that have more meat, some that produce better milk. But cows will only produce cows. Never will a cow produce a non-cow. It's scientifically impossible. There's a scientific principle known as the DNA code barrier. What that basically says is one kind, like a cow, it only has genetic information to produce cattle. Well, doesn't that mean that it can't produce non-cattle? <laughs> Absolutely. That's a problem for Darwinism, isn't it? Oh, that's a big problem for Darwinism. So Darwinism needs to be able to add massive amounts of new and beneficial genetic information to an existing gene pool. Let's keep that in mind. So fact number one, the DNA code barrier. Dogs can only produce dogs. People can only produce people. Fact number two. Micro-adaptations result, think about this, from the sorting or the loss of their starting genetic information, from the parent's starting genetic information. This is another scientific principle known as gene depletion. Well, think about this logically. If dogs only have information to produce dogs, and if the adaptations are caused by the loss of information, so their gene pool is getting less and less able to adapt, isn't that a problem for Darwinism? Oh, that's a big problem for Darwinism. Once again, they have to have a method to add massive amounts of new and beneficial genetic information to the existing gene pool, which brings us to fact number three. Increasing new and beneficial genetic information in the existing gene pool is a major problem for Darwinism. As of today, scientists know of no way for nature to add appreciable amounts of new and beneficial genetic information to an existing gene pool. <clears throat> they should have millions of examples. I can show millions of examples of kinds bringing forth after their kind. Why can't they show millions of examples? How about just 100 examples? How about one viable example? They can't do it. Darwinism is a fairy tale. Now, once again, they're going to throw out a lot of misleading information to try to trip you up on the information issue. Gene transfers are oftentimes claimed by evolutionists as one way 
to get new and beneficial genetic information created. Now, it's true that gene transfers can increase the amount of DNA in an organism. Now, these have absolutely nothing to do with creating new and beneficial genetic data as Darwinism requires. In gene transfers, bacteria transfer very small amounts of DNA called plasmid transfers to other bacteria. Now, this is information transfer. This is not information creation. The data already had to exist in order to be transferred. This has nothing to do with Darwinian change. In school, students are given lots of examples of micro-adaptations, which are scientifically and biblically correct, but then they're led to think in terms of Darwinian macroevolution. It's the old bait-and-switch con game. Talk about scientifically and biblically correct micro and switch the discussion to macro. Darwin has focused the discussion on micro because there's no viable evidence of macro to show anybody. When, in fact, Charles Darwin never saw an example of Darwinian evolution. When he went to the Galapagos Islands, Darwin made a brilliant observation. He counted 13 varieties of finches on the Galapagos, from white to yellow to black, thick bill finches to thin bill finches. He made a great observation. What had he observed? He had observed micro adaptations, finches bringing forth finches caused by the sorting or the loss of the genetic information. Of course, we didn't know that at that time. And he jumped to the miraculously erroneous conclusion that somehow that proves that all plants and animals evolved from one another. He made a great observation and a terrible conclusion. Darwin's theory, and we're being lenient to call it a theory, Darwin's theory was refuted years ago. Today, the humanistic textbooks now teach neo-Darwinism. This from a college text. Kids, change was very slow, millions of years is their magic ingredient, because it relied solely on mutations. But it still took place. They're going to teach kids that mutations add the new and beneficial genetic data. That's neo-Darwinism. And this is based on three false assumptions. One, that mutations create the new and beneficial uh, data, and that natural selection makes the mutant take over the gene pool leading to evolutionary change with the magic ingredient, which is millions and billions of years of time. They're going to say somehow a bacteria overcame the law of biogenesis and all mathematical possibility and then mutated its way to everything on Earth, including you and I, which they consider us humans to be the ultimate mutation. And if you want to believe you're the ultimate mutation, I just say, God bless you, that's your choice. I believe I was made in the image of God, just like God's word says. Back to the Harvard professor and Nobel Prize winner. He says, time is, in fact, the hero of the plot. The impossible becomes possible, given enough time. He says, time itself performs the miracles. They do indeed worship at the altar of millions of years of time. This Nobel Prize winning mutation expert stated, good mutations are so rare, we consider them all bad. Here's a problem for neo-Darwinism that mutations create the change. Mutations are also caused by the sorting or the loss of the parent starting genetic information, not by the addition of new and beneficial genetic data. Gene depletion applies to mutations just as well as to adaptations. In other words, after millions of observations, scientists can show you no examples of mutations creating new and beneficial genetic data. Have you ever heard that AIDS will evolve and or the bird flu will evolve to where the uh, antibiotics we have today will not be effective on them? Actually, there's no evolution here whatsoever, which shows their desperation and the fact they throw it out there as an example. Viruses multiply very rapidly and accumulate lots of genetic losses, genetic losses due to mutations. 
Now these are micro changes within the same kind of virus or bacteria, but a micro change due to the loss of information can still create a worldwide pandemic out of what was just a small health risk. For instance, scientists create antibodies to attach to certain proteins and viruses or bacteria and destroy them. Let's say that as an example, the protein were shaped like this. Well, the antivirus would be a mirror image that attaches to that protein and then destroys the whole body. However, if the virus has a mutation and when it's forming, it can't straighten out, so now it's shaped like this as opposed to this. Let's say it can't straighten out. It's lost that information. Now the antibody can't recognize it and attach to it. And a small health risk can become a, a worldwide health concern. But it evolved nothing. That's caused by the loss of information. And for evolutionists to try to tell people that's a proof of evolution proves to you that they have no real evidence for Darwinian change. Homeobox genes are called Hox genes for short. These are control genes. In other words, the frog has the genetic information to form a, a left rear leg, but a mutation in the Hox gene may cause it to tell it to put the leg in the wrong place. The Hox gene usually guides it to the correct location. So a mutation in the Hox gene could end up with a frog's left rear leg coming out the middle of its back or the middle of its forehead. But this is a change due to the loss of information, and it will not change an amphibian into a reptile. So oftentimes evolutionists will, will claim that Hox mutations lead to evolution. Realize that's just another evolutionary lie. They'll oftentimes claim that gene duplications can lead to Darwinian evolution. Now, it's a fact that a duplicating error can increase the amount of DNA in an organism. But once again, this has nothing to do with creating new and beneficial genetic data as Darwinism requires. Duplications are random copying errors duplicating already existing genetic information, not producing new and beneficial genetic data. It would be like a malfunction in a printing press that might print two copies of chapter nine. You would increase the information, but it would be already existing information. It would not create new and beneficial data. For instance, a fly can have a copying error and end up with four sets of wings, but it won't have the muscles or the central nervous system to control and use those wings. They will flop there and it will not be able to fly at all, which means it will be removed by what? By natural selection. So these mutations are almost always harmful or fatal. And this evolutionist wrote, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. This evolutionist who realized Darwinism was just simply inaccurate stated, mutations are always weaker. Well, gene depletion, they lose information. And in free competition, that's in nature, they are eliminated. Well, what's, what eliminates the weaker ones in nature? Natural selection. Natural selection doesn't cause evolution. Natural selection prevents evolution from being possible. So while kids today from grade school through college are being taught mutations plus natural selection lead to neo-Darwinian evolution, in real science based upon millions of observations, what we find is that the DNA code barrier plus gene depletion plus natural selection prevents Darwinian change from being possible. And this is how you can destroy Darwinism in seven seconds flat. Start your timer. The DNA code barrier plus gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism scientifically impossible. Stop the clock. That's all it takes. Sir Fred Hoyle stated, be suspicious of a theory if more and more hypotheses are needed to support it as new facts become available. This is exactly what has happened to Darwin's theory. Rather than getting rid of the fail theory like you would do in real science, they keep propping it up with excuses and false proofs. Natural selection is a scientific fact. Christians should realize that natural selection is scientific and it's biblical. If you wanted to, we could show a million examples of natural selection. 
I consider it to be God's quality assurance program. Since the adaptations and mutations are caused by the loss of genetic information, if they were not removed, within about 200 years, everything on Earth would go extinct. But they lose enough information to where they get removed by God's quality assurance program, natural selection, which keeps his originally created types genetically sound and prevents gene depletion and mutations from ruining his created kinds. Yet here's a textbook that tells kids how natural selection causes evolution. That's a lie in the textbook. Natural selection prevents evolution. It does not lead to evolution. This evolution is stated because of the lack of fossils in the fossil record to support Darwinism that some pure fantasy has crept into the textbooks. Well, let's take a look at some of the fantasies in the textbooks. Have you ever been told that Oh, let's say insects becoming resistant to insecticides are proof that they're evolving better and better. Realize, number one, that this has nothing to do with Darwinian evolution and nothing to do with the creation of new and beneficial genetic information. Let's say I had a thousand cockroaches right here on the floor, and I sprayed insecticide over them, and it killed 998 out of a thousand. Did the two survivors instantaneously evolve an immune system? Of course not. That makes no sense. They already had the gene in their DNA that allowed them to survive that particular poison. The other 998 didn't have that gene and were destroyed by the poison. Now, when these two have offspring, they will inherit that gene, and the new population will be immune to that particular poison. They evolved nothing. The gene was already there. That's proof of intelligent biblical design. An intelligent biblical designer put a wide range of variation in his created kind's gene pool so they could survive in various climates and conditions. That's the reason one dog can live outside in Nome, Alaska throughout the winter. The other can live outside in Phoenix, Arizona throughout the summer. They have adapted through the information they had in their original created gene pools. But they've lost so much information in their adaptational paths that if you switch them, they would both die. But that's proof of your intelligent biblical creator. And though it is true that bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics via a mutation that causes an antipenicillin enzyme to mass produce, is that proof of Darwinian change? Well, realize, first of all, no new and beneficial genetic information is created here. And it's actually caused by the loss of information and in nature, is well, in any way, is this a beneficial mutation? Well, if that bacteria were in a person, and if the person were in a hospital, and if the hospital were giving the person penicillin, in that one instance, it would be beneficial. But everywhere else in the world, that bacteria is using up all of its resources, making this unneeded anti-penicillin enzyme. It's the weakest one out there and gets removed by what? By natural selection. Natural selection prevents change it doesn't encourage it. And this has nothing to do with Darwinian evolution or new and beneficial uh, information creation. Have you ever been told that you are 98% the same in your biochemistry as a chimpanzee? They like to throw that around quite a bit, don't they? Actually, studies have this closer down to about 92% now. And as real science gets into the genome, that's going to widen and widen. But if similar biochemistry is proof for evolution, why don't they say we evolved from mice? Did you know your biochemistry is 96% the same as that from a mouse? In fact, did you know your biochemistry is 50% the same as that from a banana? Anyone evolved from a banana? Last time I was at a college and I asked that question, 450 students raised their hand. <laughs> kind of scared me. I think they were serious. Genetic similarity is proof of an intelligent common designer. It has nothing to do with Darwinian change. For instance, human cytochrome C is closest to that from a sunflower, yet they don't claim we evolved from sunflowers. Human eyes are closest to that from the octopus. Human skin is closest to that from pigs. Our hemoglobin structure is closest to that from root nodules. Human lysosome is closest to that from chickens. Human milk is closest to that from donkeys. On and on we could go. We have to have similar biochemistry with other plants and animals, or we wouldn't be able to eat anything except other people. I hate to tell you this, and that's, by the way, proof of an intelligent biblical creator. 
I actually hate to admit this now, but I'm actually going to be a world-renowned evolutionist here in about a week because I'm actually the first person to have any evidence of Darwinian change. I, actually, I came up with this on my own. I'm just going to make me world famous. I'll probably get a million dollars a night for speaking. But I actually discovered that watermelons are 97% water and clouds are 100% water. And I thought, hey, there's a close evolutionary link here. But I thought, boy, that 3% difference is a little too much. There have to be some missing links involved. And through years of study, I discovered that jellyfish and snow cones are both 98% water. <laughs> you see where I'm going here, right? I think they started out as a lowly watermelon and branched off in their evolutionary paths into jellyfish and snow cones. And one hot summer day, the snow cone melted and evaporated into the cloud. And I think we have our evolutionary tree of life. What do you think? Am I going to be a world-renowned evolutionist? You might be thinking, Russ, that was pretty silly. Well, that's absolutely my point. Similar biochemistry and drawing nice, colorful lines connecting things does not in any way prove Darwinian evolution. I don't care how many textbooks they put these things in. Similar DNA codes, once again, are proof of our intelligent biblical creator. We have to have similar biochemistry with other plants and animals so that we can eat and digest one another. And that's just proof of our intelligent biblical creator. In fact, once again, Nature Magazine reported that real studies are showing there's about a 7.7% difference between chimps and man. That number will continue to, to widen as real science gets into the genome. But think about this. Talk about awesome proof of our intelligent biblical creator. The human DNA contain, think about this, 3 billion base pairs of information per cell, 3 billion base pairs of information through all the cells in your body. A 7.7% difference would require 231 million beneficial information adding mutations to take place just to change a chimp into a human. And science can't show you one example between bacteria and everything on Earth. And since so many are fatal mutations, there's no way you could get 231 million of them in a row without killing the thing off anyways. Darwinism is scientifically and mathematically completely impossible. Remember, all point mutations at the molecular level reduce the genetic information, gene depletion. That's just one more dagger. Let me put another dagger through the heart of Darwinism. Darwinists for years have said that once we got into the study of the genome, of the human genome, we would find repressed genes of our evolutionary background proving evolution. I guess they thought we'd find repressed genes from our ape background and pig background and pumpkin background, whatever it is they think we evolved from. What has real science found when they got into the human genome? Well, they found that humans only have human genes. Now, you might have brown eyes and have repressed genes for green eyes, but they were human eyes. In fact, humans only have human genes, pigs only have pig genes, pine trees only have pine tree genes, whales only have whale genes. This is yet one more dagger right through the heart of evolution, yet they continue to teach it in the school systems. Mind-boggling. Ernst Haeckel read Darwin's book a year after it came out. He said it was the turning point in his thinking starting in 1860. Well, he had the same problem that Darwinists have today. Ten years later, he still had no evidence to support Darwinism. So he did what evolutionists have been famous for ever since. He made up some proof. I'm going to show you a picture that shows his drawings of a human and some various creatures in the embryonic stage going from left to right across the top. Right below them will be the actual photos. You'll see that his drawings going left to right across the top look very similar. The photos do not look like his drawings. What he had done was he took a human in the embryonic stage and made copies of it and labeled them fish and salamanders and turtles and chickens, etc. And he came up with the biogenetic law. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Yeah, how's a kid supposed to argue with that, right? Absolutely. This was proven fraud in the 1870s, still taught in college today. 
And my feeling is that fraud in the 19th century is still fraud in the 21st century. In embryology, and there are some, some very fine embryologists, but I'm sure they're, they're ashamed of a lot of the frauds that have taken place under their name of, in their field of science. But in the initial stages of development, vertebra embryos are radically different. You need to realize Darwinists claim that they should be very similar. Animal embryos first undergo cleavage where the fertilized egg divides into thousands of cells. Each major group of animals, mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles, follow very different and very distinctive cleavage patterns. This proves they did not evolve from a common ancestor. Animal embryos then enter the gastrulation stage where their cells rearrange and generate basic tissue types and the general layout of the body. Once again, each major group of animals follows a very different and very distinct process. Once again, this goes absolutely against Darwinian teachings. Only after these two processes do the embryos very briefly resemble one another. Yet here's a brand new textbook, still teaching, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. They say, look, kids, you have gill slits or gill pouches. You're going through your fish phase. Well, let me point something out. You never had gill slits, you never had gills, and you never had gill pouches. Those are folds in the skin that later develop into the throat uh, organs in the human. You never have gills of any sort. That's purely fraud in the textbooks. Here's a college book. They show the drawing of a whale's flipper or the forelimb of a dog or a horse or a cat and the forelimb of a human. And they say, look, kids, they all have two bones in the forelimb, proving they evolved from a common ancestor. Well, I'll admit that's the most impressive supposed proof that they have. But couldn't I also say that they have similar bone structure because they have the same designer? Absolutely. I drive a Chevy pickup truck, and my next door neighbor drives a Chevy van, and their dashboards are identical. It's not because they evolved from a moped because they have the same designer, right? Absolutely. You know, we have similar structures with other critters because we have similar, a similar designer. A switch gene turns on and off genetic information. Scientists have been able to replace a switch gene in a fly with the same switch gene they took from a mouse. And the fly still developed the fly's eye. It still conducted the, the information through. But that's not proof of evolution, that's proof of a similar designer. This has nothing to do with the creation of new and beneficial genetic data. And it also shows massive amounts of intelligent input. For instance, the same wall switch controls the outlet that powers my laptop and the projector, yet it doesn't mean they evolve from each other, does it? Of course not. Sometimes evolutionists will throw out snowflakes or crystals or something like a tornado, which they actually show order, and they'll say this proves nature can uh, create complexity. But does the order found in a snowflake or a rock crystal or a salt crystal or a tornado prove complex living systems can form on their own? Well, biologically speaking, there's a vast difference between the order that is found in a snowflake and the complexity found in a living, functioning cellular system. Crystals formed by the orderly arrangement of their properties. They exhibit order, they do not exhibit complexity. Cells formed due to the specified complex genetic information found in their DNA. Living systems exhibit both order and complexity. Though snowflakes may be beautiful to look at, unlike living cells, snowflakes cannot ingest specific nutrients to turn into energy. They don't communicate with each other. They don't reproduce themselves, nor do they form complex biological systems. There's no comparison between order and complexity. Evolutionists claim that things evolve bigger and better. But the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, says things get worse and worse, not better and better. The second law of thermodynamics is 
sometimes by evolutionists claim to not apply to biological systems. They say that the open system we live in with an unlimited supply of energy coming in from the sun overcomes the law of, bio, uh, excuse me, the law of entropy, which makes me wonder well, how did they ever discover it in the first place. But actually, raw energy speeds up destruction and leads to entropy. It doesn't prevent entropy. Raw, undirected energy like sunlight is incapable of producing any specified complex information that is found in living systems. Hoping that undirected raw energy is going to improve a system is like pouring gasoline on top of a car and flipping a match on top of it, thinking somehow that's going to improve its gas mileage. And you don't think that's going to happen, do you? Of course not. Dr. John Ross of Harvard stated, the second law applies equally to open systems. The notion is that the law fails for such systems. It is important to make sure that this error does not perpetuate itself. It's the important issue here really is not the energy. It's the information available to the system. It's a matter of information, not energy. The study of our origins has never been about the evidence. We all have the same evidence to test, study, and observe. It's about the philosophical framework through which the evidences are interpreted. This former Harvard professor stated, we take the side of evolutionary science because we have a prior commitment to materialism. It's their religious belief. He says, it is not that the methods of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation. It's not the scientific facts. On the contrary, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. It is their religious bias. It has nothing to do with the scientific evidences and facts. And under the guise that science always corrects itself, humanists continue using unfounded claims to promote their religious philosophy, teaching our kids that their religious philosophy is science. Darwin stated, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. I agree. If Darwin's theory were true, there should be millions of examples in the fossil record. And they show these evolutionary trees of life. And at the base, they have our supposed invertebrate ancestor. Notice how they have the word invertebrate ancestor. They don't show what it is. <laughs> it's because they don't have the slightest idea what that would be. And then they show these nice, colorful lines connecting everything on Earth together. Is that how you prove Darwinism? You take a box of crayons and you color lines connecting things together? That's really the best proof that they can come up with? Hmm, interesting. For one of these branches, these colorful branches to be true, wouldn't they have to be made up of literally thousands of transitional kinds, one slowly changing into the other, correct? Well, 150 years after Darwin's book was published, science has zero indisputable missing links. They have a small handful of very disputable claims. They should have millions of examples, and they, they just don't have them. And taking a box of crayons and drawing lines connecting things doesn't prove evolution. It'd be like me taking an orange crayon and drawing it from my laptop to the first person sitting in the front row and saying, this proves you evolved from my laptop. Now, maybe you'll buy that, maybe you'll believe it, but believe me, there's no reason to believe it. Where is the scientific evidence in this? There is none. And I guess I would ask one question. Why don't they get rid of the misrepresentations and the frauds and the lies and just fill the textbooks with the real evidence for evolution from a Darwinian standpoint? Oh, they don't have any. So they, they have to keep this type of thing in the textbooks or they can just take it out altogether. Yet, this textbook tells the kids we have evidence from the fossil record. Well, they certainly should. And they claim that Archaeopteryx is a missing link between reptile and bird. I thought they had given up on this 20 years ago, but they've put it back into the books. Have you been taught the, that Archaeopteryx is a missing link between reptiles and birds before? They say, well, Archaeopteryx was the size of a pigeon and had claws on its wing. And they say that proves it was a reptile becoming a bird. They don't point out that the Hoitzen, who lives in South America today, is about the size of a pigeon and has claws on its wings and is about the size of a pigeon. And 
Nobody claims it's a missing link. That could be Archaeopteryx for all I know. But here's a bigger problem for the Darwinian tail. Keep in mind, they say the strata layers form slowly over millions of years. So the lower in the strata layer, the older something should be. Well, scientists back in 1986 found modern bird fossils in the layer below Archaeopteryx. So if modern birds were there before Archaeopteryx, he couldn't be a missing link. He was just a bird, a perching bird. And here's a real dagger through this fairy tale of Darwinism. Reptile DNA, it doesn't contain the genetic information to form feathers, which are very complex structures. The DNA code barrier, gene depletion, science knows of no way for nature to have added that type of information. In fact, this fellow from the British Museum of Natural History, and they have the largest fossil collection in the world, stated, there is no fossil evidence of the remarkable change from reptile to bird. There is no evidence of this taking place. Yet here's a modern textbook showing all sorts of critters and reptiles connected together with a solid red line going from the reptiles to Archaeopteryx. And then they've got this dotted line going up to modern birds. So my question to you is if a solid red line is based on no evidence, what does the dotted line represent? <laughs> Mind-boggling. Yet this modern uh, biology high school book tells the kids one thing is certain. Birds evolve from ancient reptiles. This is the reason we're losing so many Christian kids. They're being taught this as fact, and they're not seeing what a fraud it is. It only takes a couple of minutes for me to reveal this information to people. We just need the opportunity to do so. Now, once every couple of years, it seems, they come out with front page headlines of the missing link found between reptile and bird. I don't know why they've hung their hat on having to find this one link. Keep in mind, if we went from bacteria to everything on Earth, they should have trillions of missing links. So since they don't find any, what are the odds of them finding the one they want without finding hundreds of millions of others first? And really, it doesn't make any sense, does it? But this, they, they had announced this missing link, and then this came out in USA Today a couple months later. The missing link that wasn't, this true missing link between dinosaurs and birds, sprouted its tail not 120 million years ago, but <clears throat> just before being smuggled out of China. It had children believing in feathered dinosaurs that never existed, prominent scientists calling each other names, and two respected science publications under assault. Why are they so easily fooled? It's because they're so desperate for anything that they can use as proof for Darwinism. Back to the textbooks, they say we have other transitional links, like the reptile-like amphibian Samoria. This was found in 1882. But just the change in eggs would require the addition of a hard shell, a yolk, a biochemical change, and a completely new genital system for the amphibian. There's no way this took place. Scientists know of no way for nature to add the information. And this scientist states, 99% of the biology of any organism resides in the soft anatomy which is inaccessible in a fossil. Bones will sing any song you want to hear. You can make up any story you want about these reptile bones, but they're not a missing link. They say we also have the mammal-like reptiles or the therapsids. Well, think about this. Mammals have a different heart than reptiles. They're warm-blooded, they produce milk, they have a different respiratory system, and a complex internal temperature control system, and other organs that reptiles do not have. And once again, science knows of no way for nature to add that kind of information. They appear suddenly in the fossil record, and they disappear just as suddenly. They were a very special critter that God had created. They didn't adapt well to the post-flood world and disappeared. Have you ever been shown the whale evolution series? Now, this is a real work of evolutionary art. And by the way, you should realize evolutionists are experts at drawing things that never existed in order to support their theory that never took place. Notice most of their supposed proofs are drawings. The whale evolution series is a good example. The first critter is just an extinct land mammal, had nothing to do with water. Well, he probably drank some every now and then. But Ambulocetus is a real work of art. 
These are the bones found of Ambulocetus. The black bones were found in a different strata layer in a different location. They're not even from the same critter. But by putting the two sets of bones together, they came up with about 25% of a skeleton. It had no pelvic girdle. They don't know if it ran, flew, walked, swam, or what. But they said this is the missing link between the land animal and the whale. And Bacillosaurus is actually a reptile-like critter who is 10 times that size. But if they drew him to scale, he wouldn't fit the propaganda, would he? Why don't they get the propaganda and the misleading information out of the textbooks and put in the real evolution evidence? Well, because they don't have any. The horse evolution series is the same way. The fossils have never been found in the order presented. The modern horse fossils have actually been found in layers below the supposed ancient horse. And even if this were true and it's not, they'd just be horses producing horses, right? They'd just be micro-adaptations. They wouldn't be Darwinian evolution anyways. They say they also have the missing link between the fish and the amphibian. They say the lobe fin fish walked around on the bottom of the ocean until I guess he got bored one day and walked out on land and became an amphibian. It's a nice story. They thought that the lobe fin fish had been extinct for between 30 and 300 million years. Well, the problems with this are many. Once again, notice that their proof are drawings. Uh, for instance, the amphibian has feet, toes, claws, shoulders, elbows, ankles, etc., muscles, and a central nervous system to control all of these changes. It has a totally different neck. And science knows of no way for nature to add any ge beneficial genetic information much less the millions and millions of pieces that would be needed here. And even worse, 70 years ago, they found the lobe fin fish was alive today, not extinct for 30 to 300 million years. And guess what? He doesn't walk around on the bottom of the ocean. He's a very good swimmer. And if you look at the fossilized version, which we're told is up to 300 million years old, he looks just like the living lobe fin fish today. I thought things evolved over long periods of time. See, the problems here are many. The fossil record is an embarrassment to evolution. They're constantly saying the fossil record is their friend. That is a lie. That is a total bluff. The fossil record is a total embarrassment to Darwinism. And it's because those layers were laid down in a global flood just a few thousand years ago. We'll cover that when we cover the global flood theory. Appropriately, on April Fool's Day, 2006, they announced their messiah for missing uh, links between the fish and the amphibian. Tectilec rosea, and they said, listen to this carefully. They announced, well, it's still a fish, but it's exhibiting changes that anticipate the beginnings of changes. How do you anticipate the beginnings of these changes? In other words, they had no proof. It was all over the headlines for weeks. Remember the coelacanth, who supposedly walked on the uh, bottom of the floor before hiking out to become an amphibian? Well, He's found alive today, and the coelacanth shows zero evolutionary changes, and the coelacanth has bones just like those found in Rosea. They never evolved in the coelacanth, and they never evolved in this fish either. Transitional fossils are in the eye of the beholder, and never have the transitional links that hit the headlines held up to the following scientific scrutiny. They always disappear a couple of months later, but only after misleading millions of people. You know, thousands of plants and various types of critters are found entombed in amber. And we're told that this amber is almost 150 million years old. Yet the entombed creatures look just like living kinds today. No evolution is found in the fossil record or in the amber. Stephen Gould stated, the absence of fossil evidence for the intermediary stages has been a persistent problem for evolution. Well, it's more than a problem that refutes the whole supposed theory. Have you ever heard of the Cambrian explosion? Keep in mind, the evolutionary story is somehow a bacteria cell or some single cell creature overcame the law of biogenesis and then mutated its way slowly over millions and millions of years to everything on Earth today. Another problem that they have is in the lowest layer that contains appreciable amounts of fossils, the Cambrian layer, all of the basic body types are found. They don't know how to explain that, so they call it the Cambrian explosion. All of a sudden, life just exploded. 
that goes against their, what they teach, and it actually it sounds quite a bit like instantaneous creation to me. This evolutionist stated, in the not-too-distant past, there was almost no fossil material. Speculation was intense. Well, <clears throat> to be truthful, there's still not much real data so that speculation is still active. Active speculation like that used to get me a spanking when I was a kid. Well, back in 1930, they had the same problem that they have today. They didn't have any evidence to support Darwinism. So Richard Goldschmidt came up with the hopeful monster theory, which basically states that there's no evidence because, well, perhaps reptiles laid eggs and birds popped out, leaving no evidence behind. Well, actually, it had to be a male and a female bird to carry on the species. Well, folks were laughing at the hopeful monster theory, so about 50 years later, around 1980, Niles Eldridge and Stephen Gould changed Hopeful Monster slightly and gave it a much better name. It's now called Punctuated Equilibrium. And believe it or not, this is a key concept for Darwinism. What they said is that, well, basically, evolution didn't just happen overnight, but it happened in such short geological spurts of time that no evidence was captured in the fossil record. So if you think it's just me, a Bible-believing Christian, saying they've got no evidence for Darwinism, Realize they've got a key theory to explain why they've got what? No evidence. They've got no evidence. Which is odd because I thought real operational science was knowledge derived from the study of evidence. Darwinism is not science. It's a religious philosophy which is actually undermining real science. Dr. Dwayne Gish defined Darwinism as the sustenance of fossils hoped for the evidence of links unseen. Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must have existed. Darwinism fails its own critical criteria. And if it were real science, would have never even gotten into the textbooks to begin with. This uh, former and famed evolutionist stated, it's a great misfortune if an entire branch of science becomes addicted to a false theory. But this is what has happened in biology. Believe it or not, today, modern biology is based on Darwinian-style change being true. He went on to state that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. I hope he's correct. If we can get this information out to enough people, it will be. The Bible says, where is the wise? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, you might be thinking, well, come on, Russ, what about the ape men? We've all been shown the ape men. Here's a brand new textbook showing mankind connected to everything on earth with a nice red line. I mean, what more could you want for proof than a nice red line, right? How about some missing links? This is Java Man. It was probably the first major supposed missing link found by Eugene Du Bois in 1891. They had found the skull cap of an ape and the thigh bone, the femur, of a human. They were found in the same general area, and thus was born Java Man. They failed to point out that humans in the area ate, ate brains all the time, so finding the skull cap near a human bone was nothing spectacular. This was the Messiah for evolution for about 45 years, from around 1910, 1912 to the mid-1950s, down Man. What was found was the skull cap of a human and the jawbone of an ape. And this was born Piltdown Man. It was used as proof of evolution at the Scopes trial between the teaching of creation and evolution. It's one of the major reasons evolution got into the textbooks. After misleading not millions, but billions of people into rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it was proven that these guys had taken the skull cap of a human and the jawbone from an orangutan and filed them down to fit together, acid treated both sides, and buried them in a rock quarry for two years, and came along and discovered Piltdown Man, and spent the rest of their lives as world-renowned evolutionists. Mind-boggling. Proven a fraud finally in the mid-1950s. Nebraska Man was a work of evolutionary art. All that was found in Nebraska Man was a piece of a broken tooth. But evolutionists are very creative. From that broken tooth, they not only recreated Nebraska man and his family, but even the tools they would have worked with from a piece of a broken tooth. 
It was later proven the tooth came from an extinct pig. And there's the real Nebraska man right there. In 1932, Louis Leakey, famous founder of the Leakey Clan of Eight Men Finders, discovered a lower jawbone. It was crushed into about 40 pieces. It had all apes teeth, but he reconstructed those 40 pieces into the shape of a human jawbone, and thus was born Ramapithecus, the missing link. Once again, for 45 years, Ramapithecus adorned textbooks, misleading hundreds of millions of people. Then in 1977, it was proven it was the jawbone of an orangutan after misleading millions and millions of people. Hmm. A kid studying to be a dentist gave me his advanced biology book. He said, Russ, look through my book and pick out some frauds. Well, I don't really have any place to put the frauds, but he wanted me to look through it, so I did so, and I was flipping through the book, and there was the drawing of Ramapithecus's teeth. That caught my eye. So I stopped, and now, 30 years later, they put the drawing back in the textbook with a new name. They now call it Civipithecus. And they say, kids, Civipithecids are more closely related to humans. This genus now includes the animal formerly known as Ramapithecus, proven to be an orangutan 30 years ago. In Spain, they found a small skull cap, and thus was born Orsay Man, declared to be the oldest human fossil ever found in Europe. It was later discovered that the skull cap came from a donkey. Is it really that easy to fool evolutionists? Absolutely. Why? because they don't have any real evidence to fall back upon. This is Lucy. This has been the Messiah for evolution for the past 30 years, even though for about 25 years they've known it's just an ape. It stood about three and a half feet tall, drug its knuckles on the ground. It had curved toes and curved fingers for grabbing onto tree limbs. Yet they said, well, the thigh bone has to angle the hookup with the knee joint. And since human thigh bones angle, they say that proves it's becoming human. Well, what they didn't point out is almost all tree-dwelling apes had angle femurs. There is no proof of evolution there. And yet this from 20 years ago. Scientists have concluded that these creatures are not a missing link between ape and man and did not walk upright in the human manner. They've known it didn't walk upright for 20 years, yet here's a brand new textbook showing Lucy walking perfectly upright. That's pure propaganda and fraud. It shows Lucy with normal human feet, even though it had curved toes for grabbing onto tree limbs with. Pure propaganda. So here's the new textbooks. They say, kids, we have recent hominid discoveries. Hominids are supposedly the closest link between ape and man. They say we have Tomei man, the oldest known hominid found, making their finders world-renowned evolutionists. And in 2001, Maeve Leakey, that's Lewis Leakey's daughter-in-law, found flat-faced man. Let's take a look at these two. So this is the oldest known human ancestor. This Harvard professor says the face and teeth resemble those of humans. Well, <laughs> if you think that looks like a human, that's certainly your choice. It certainly looks like a gorilla to me. But when they found this in 2002, Nature Magazine reported this is just an ancient ape. Science News reported the specimen's teeth are apes. It did not walk upright on two legs. They knew it was an ape when they found it. They wait four years and put it in the textbooks and tell your kids they have proof they evolved from apes. Well, what about flat-faced man? Well, Mae Vleeke and her friends found this. This skull about the size of a softball was crushed into about 50 pieces. They reconstructed it. Now, after they reconstructed it, they said the face is slightly flatter than a normal ape's face. Slightly flatter? If you took the skull of everyone in this room, they'd be different angles, right? Slightly flatter, and they reconstructed it, so it goes in the textbooks as the closest missing link. You know what the textbooks don't point out? Is that flat-faced man would have stood two feet tall. He was two feet tall. That's pure fraud and propaganda in the textbooks. Louis Leakey's wife, Maeve Leakey, an avid evolutionist, admitted, all those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense. Why is that? Because to be true, they would be made up of missing links. In the fossil record, none have been found that will hold up to scrutiny. And here's a brand new textbook showing kids that humans are related to all sorts of apes, including tarsiers. We're related to tarsiers? <laughs> Grandma, what big eyes you've got. So 
So why are they doing this? Well, this Nobel Prize winning scientist stated a year and a half ago that anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done. And as I've shown you, they are willing to do just about anything, except bring out the real evidence, that is. Frankfurt University's professor, Reiner Prosch von Zeiten, would be a good example. He was credited with discovering the oldest known Homo sapien, which he dated at 36,000 years old, making him a world-renowned evolutionist. He was also considered to be a carbon-dating specialist. But then it was discovered this guy was a fraud. He didn't even know how to run the carbon dating equipment, so he just made up dates. In fact, one of the skulls he promoted came from a man who died 250 years ago. He was a world-renowned evolutionist for over 30 years. Mind-boggling. This former Yale professor of anthropology and co-author of the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Human Evolution stated about human evolution theories that they reveal more about how humans view themselves than they do about how humans came about. In other words, if you want to believe you evolved from an ape or pond scum or whatever, that is your choice. Just don't think science backs you up. It does not. Think about this logically. With millions of individual apes and monkeys having lived and died over the past 500 years alone, why does finding a monkey bone prove evolution? Doesn't it just prove that when apes and monkeys die, they leave their bones behind? Absolutely. The Bible tells us to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some people professing have erred concerning their faith. You know, this was written at the time the Gnostics were using false knowledge to undermine people's faith in the scriptural God. Well, there's a lot of false knowledge out there today, and two of the leading components are Darwinian evolution and millions of years of death and suffering leading to man. A review of Darwinism versus real science will show you that no one has ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve. The fossil record shows no intermediate kinds. Living species show no intermediate kinds flopping around on Earth today. Natural selection removes any rare mutations. It doesn't cause them to take over the gene pool. The law of biogenesis, the DNA code barrier, gene depletion, the first and the second laws of thermodynamics, etc., say Darwinism is scientifically impossible. Mathematical probability says it never could have happened. And no one has ever seen nature add new and beneficial genetic information to an existing gene pool. This philosopher stated the theory of evolution will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel at so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could have been accepted. He's saying people will be laughing at us for having believed in this fairy tale. The Bible says professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now this doesn't mean that someone who is fooled is stupid. There are, for instance, Darwinism. There are a lot of brilliant people that believe in Darwinism. It just means that they've been fooled. And since that's all that's taught in our school system, we should certainly understand why people are fooled. And the Bible goes on to state that they will change the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I believe is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. It sounds to me like they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution. But the teaching of naturalistic neo-Darwinism is simply humanistic indoctrination, which is undermining scientific research, it's undermining scientific education, and it's undermining the faith of billions of people around the world. Now, Louis Leakey would be a prime example. He was the child of Christian missionaries to Africa. And he grew up and wanted to spend his life as a missionary in Africa himself. But he went off to college and lost his faith and dedicated his life to refuting biblical creation. Every single discovery that made him a world-renowned evolutionist has been scientifically refuted today. Michael Shermer is another good example. He went off to college to become a pastor but studied psychology and lost his faith 
He's now the director of Skeptic Society and editor of Skeptic Magazine and the author of many anti-Christian books. A brilliant individual fooled by the false teachings of Darwinism. Christianity has no quarrel with real science. One of the lies that evolutionists will throw out there is someone like myself is against science. Not at all. I'm for real science. I'm actually the one person standing up for science here. We have no quarrel with real science because real science finds the truth and truth comes from God. We only object to lies and false science being put in textbooks to undermine people's faith in their biblical creator. And under the guise, science always corrects itself, humanists continue using their unfounding claims to promote their religious philosophy. The creation-evolution issue is not going to fade away anytime soon because free-thinking people do not accept being told that there are some questions that they are not allowed to ask and some answers that they are not allowed to question. As the evidence against Darwinism continues to explode, expect more and more of their false claims and hypothetical theories to try to cover its demise. Jesus said, ye are to be the salt of the earth. You know, when salt gets into an open wound where someone perhaps has been misled by Darwinism and such, it may sting a little bit. When I was a theistic evolutionist and someone said, you're wrong about this, you need to look at this information, Oh, it might have stung a little bit when I found out I was wrong. The bad news was I was wrong. But the good news, which is about a billion times better, is that the word of God is true. We are to be the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be strewn on the ground and trampled under the foot of man. Let's learn the information. Let's stand up for ourselves, our families, our neighbors, our friends, our church members, and let's learn some information and be the salt. Let me end this session with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for every dear soul that is here tonight. I thank you for this great information that you have given to us so that we will know without question that we can believe your word, word for word and cover to cover, and put our trust and faith in your Son. In his name I do give this prayer. Amen. Amen.